Well, congregation, at this time, let me invite you to turn in your copy of God's Word now uh, to Genesis chapter 26. Genesis chapter 26. And uh, if you're following along in the Pew Bible, uh, you should be able to find that on page 25. This morning we come to likely a very well-known story of Jacob tricking his own father to receive the blessing which God had actually promised to give to him. Uh, We see the brokenness of this home, and uh, it will result in the consequences which Lord willing will see next week, results in him having to flee for his life to live with his uncle Laban. Uh, But this morning we want to pick the story up at uh, verse 34 of chapter 26, the last two verses of that chapter. And uh, then we're going to read through chapter 27, verse 40. So it's a sizable chunk, so as always, you'll want to keep your Bible open as we go through this. Um, But as always, this is God's holy word. Let us receive it as such. Genesis 26, verse 34. When Esau was 40 years old, he married Judith, daughter of Bere, the Hittite, and also Basemath, daughter of Elon, the Hittite. They were a source of grief to Isaac and Rebekah. When Isaac was old and his eyes were so weak that he could no longer see, he called for Esau, his older son, and said to him, My son, here I am, he answered. Isaac said, I am now an old man and don't know the day of my death. Now then, get your weapons, your quiver and bow, and go out to the open country to hunt some wild game for me. Prepare me the kind of tasty food I like. And bring it to me to eat, so that I may give you my blessing before I die. Now Rebekah was listening as Isaac spoke to his son Esau. When Esau left for the open country to hunt game and bring it back, Rebekah said to her son Jacob, Look, I overheard your father say to your brother Esau, Bring me some game and prepare me some tasty food to eat, so that I may give you my blessing in the presence of the Lord before I die. Now, my son, listen carefully and do what I tell you. Go out to the flock and bring me two choice young goats so I can prepare some tasty food for your father just the way he likes it. Then take it to your father to eat so he may give you his blessing before he dies. Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, But my brother Esau is a hairy man, and I am a man with smooth skin. What if my father touches me? I would appear to be tricking him and would bring down a curse on myself rather than a blessing. His mother said to him, My son, let the curse fall on me. Just do what I say. Go and get them for me. So he went and got them and brought them to his mother, and she prepared some tasty food just the way his father liked it. Then Rebekah took the best clothes of Esau, her older son, which she had in the house, and put them on her younger son, Jacob. She also covered his hands and the smooth part of his neck with the goat skins. Then she handed to her son, Jacob, the tasty food and the bread she had made. He went to his father and said, My father. Yes, my son, he answered. Who is it? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Please sit up and eat some of my game so that you may give me your blessing." Isaac asked his son, How did you find it so quickly, my son? The Lord your God gave me success, he replied. And Isaac said to Jacob, Come near so I can touch you, my son, to know whether you really are my son Esau or not. Jacob went close to his father Isaac, who touched him, and said, The voice is the voice of Jacob, but the hands are the hands of Esau. He did not recognize him, for his hands were hairy like those of his brother Esau. So he blessed him. Are you really my son Esau, he asked. I am, he replied. Then he said, my son, bring me some of your game to eat so that I may give you my blessing. Jacob brought it to him, and he ate, and he brought some wine, and he drank. Then his father Isaac said to him, come here, my son, and kiss me. So he went to him and kissed him. When Isaac caught the smell of his clothes, he blessed him and said, ah, the smell of my son is like the smell of a field. That, God, that the Lord has blessed. May God give you of heaven's dew and of earth's riches an abundance of grain and new wine. May nations serve you and peoples bow down to you. 
Be Lord over your brothers, and may the sons of your mother bow down to you. May those who curse you be cursed, and those who bless you be blessed. After Isaac finished blessing him, and Jacob had scarcely left his father's presence, his brother Esau came in from hunting. He too prepared some tasty food and brought it to his father. Then he said to him, My father, sit up and eat some of my game, so that you may give me your blessing. His father Isaac asked him, Who are you? I am your son, he answered, your firstborn, Esau. Isaac trembled violently and said, Who was it then that hunted game and brought it to me? I ate it just before you came, and I blessed him, and indeed he will be blessed. When Esau heard his father's words, he burst out with a loud and bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me, me too, my father. But he said, your brother came deceitfully and took your blessing. Esau said, isn't he rightly named Jacob? He has deceived me these two times. He took my birthright, and now he's taken my blessing. Then he asked, haven't you reserved any blessing for me? Isaac answered Esau, I have made him lord over you and have made all his relatives your servant, or made all his relatives his servants, and I have sustained him with grain and new wine. So what can I possibly do for you, my son? Esau said to his father, Do you have only one blessing, my father? Bless me too, my father. Then Esau wept aloud. His father Isaac answered him, Your dwelling will be away from the earth's riches, away from the dew of heaven above. You will live by the sword, and you will serve your brother. But when you grow restless, you will throw his yoke off your neck. And there ends the reading of God's holy word. As always, we are dependent on God the Holy Spirit now to bless the preaching of this word. Let's pray for his presence. Our God and our fathers, we have just sung, Give me but Jesus, my Lord crucified. Father, that is the prayer of all of your children present here this morning. Give us but Jesus now through this word. Father, bless now your servant as he speaks. We pray, Lord, that it would not be his words, but your words. We ask, O Lord, that you would send God the Holy Spirit to bless the hearing of the word, that as we sit under it together, he would be active in our hearts to open up this passage that we would have understanding. Father, where correction is needed this morning, would we receive it as from you? Father, where encouragement is found, we pray, Lord, bless us abundantly. And Father, most of all, we pray that we would behold our Savior this morning. And we ask this in Christ's name alone. Amen. Well, when I was working in construction with my dad, there was kind of a playful saying that we would banter about with the other contractors. And that saying goes as follows. That the difference between a good builder and a great builder is that a great builder knows how to cover up his mistakes so they're unnoticeable. Uh, the saying was playful, and we intentionally didn't use it in front of the homeowner, Uh, But it just acknowledged the fact that with every builder, with every construction project, there are going to be mistakes. There are going to be things that go wrong, and the great builder is the one who knows how to hide it so that no one can see it. Uh, The great builder who is able to take something crooked, something put out of line, and to cover it over to make it look as it was intended. Well, in many ways, if that is true about human construction, this morning we learn that God is the greatest builder of all time. Because He is able to build the church, He's able to build the people from some of the crookedest sticks possible. Uh, God is the greatest builder because the whole Bible teaches that, that from a people like us, God builds a church. He has a plan of salvation that He promised all the way back in the Garden of Eden. And from that moment on, God has been active in all of human history to bring about all of His promises. And with every generation, there has been sinners and messy people through whom God has worked to build His church. See, God is the greatest builder not because He makes mistakes, but because His people do. And you see, this chapter this morning is on full display how messy God's church really is. What I love about the Bible is it holds back nothing of the warts and the imperfections and yes, even the broken, dysfunctional home of Isaac and Rebecca. On full display here, we have a believing household which is not living at all like a believing household. And yet, God does not leave them. 
God does not forsake them. God works through them. In fact, remarkably this morning, the point that we need to get from the text is God even works through their sin. Things that are offensive to God, God will use to make sure His promises will stand. We learned this morning, God is a sovereign God. And even the sins of His people will not thwart His plan. The whole Bible from beginning to end is about messy people being used by God for salvation. Ultimately leading, of course, to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now as we jump into the text, we're reminded that we are in the middle of seeing the the brief period of Isaac's life, the continuing promise from Abraham to Isaac, and now we're transitioning to Jacob. We're going to have a whole lot more to do with Jacob, and Jacob is going to make us feel very uncomfortable because he's a very messy person. In fact, in this text, the question that is raised is, are any of the sons worthy of the blessing? Esau is unworthy, but even Jacob here shows that it's by grace. Jacob shows himself to be a scoundrel, and the only explanation for God's redeeming grace in his life is simply that undeserved grace of God's sovereignty. So here's the theme with God's help I hope to show you from this large passage. We learn that God's sovereign plan cannot be thwarted even by the sins of his people. God's sovereign plan cannot be thwarted even by the sins of his people. I have three points walking through the passage to get to that. First of all, we need to note the discovery of blessing. The discovery, Isaac's scheme here and Rebekah's discovery of it. Secondly, we need to note the deception of blessing. How heinous the deception really is that leads to the blessing. And then thirdly and finally, we'll note the division of the blessing. How by the end of the story, the blessing has been given and it divides these two brothers between two paths of which they have embarked on. So the discovery of blessing, deception of blessing, and then the division of blessing. And first of all, note the discovery of blessing. And we need to note a couple of things as the narrative gets off the ground. The first thing we need to note is Esau's spiritual unworthiness uh, in the family life. Look at verses 34 and 35 of chapter 26 for a moment. It says, when Esau was 40 years old, he married Judith, daughter of Beri, the Hittite, and also Basemath, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite. They were a source of grief to Isaac and Rebekah. Uh, Now, be reminded of what we saw last week. This follows immediately the context of the life of Isaac being perfect parallel to Abraham. That was what we saw last week, how Isaac's life perfectly paralleled the good and the bad of his father Abraham. And that's intentional because notice that Esau departs from it completely. Esau's pattern is like we saw a couple weeks ago. He's a man driven by his sensual nature. He's a man driven by the desires of the flesh. And once again, he has no concern for the spiritual marriage that his grandfather Abraham was. Notice that he marries not one, but two, so we already have a breaking of God's plan of marriage there. But notice he marries unbelievers. He marries the Canaanites. He marries two neighboring women who are not believers, whom God has forbidden believers to marry. Uh, This will be important in a moment because by the end of chapter 28, we will note that it is these marriages that bookend the story of Esau. He will actually try to marry someone different to make up for this, and it also will be an error. The point you need to see here, though, is Esau has no spiritual concern in his life. Esau will do what Esau wants to do despite what God tells him to do, and so he doesn't follow after Abraham. Remember what Abraham did. A couple chapters ago, he would not allow his son to marry an unbeliever, so he sent his servant off to be led by God to get Rebekah. Why? Because the Canaanites are under God's curse. They are unbelievers. I'd be reminded again, this has nothing to do with race. It has to do with religion. It has to make a priority of the greatest relationship, being with God, being reflected in the life of believers. And therefore, we see Esau has no concern for marrying a godly woman. And notice as well, and this will be brought up once again later on, the bookend of Esau's life, this ungodly marriage was a grief to his parents. It was a grief to his parents dealing with the false gods no doubt brought into the household. It was a grief to realize that their two daughter-in-laws did not share the most important part of life. It was a grief to them that he brought these unbelievers into the home. But the point is, there's a spiritual divide now. Esau is showing on full display. He has no concern for the things of God. Now, notice as we pick up the story now, that leads now into his father still wanting to give his unspiritual son a spiritual blessing. Look at verse 1. It says, when Isaac was old and his eyes were so weak that he could no longer see, 
He called for Esau, his older son, and said to him, My son, here I am, he answered. Isaac said, I am now an old man and don't know the day of my death. Now then, get your weapons, your quiver and bow, and go out to the open country to hunt some wild game for me. Prepare me the kind of tasty food I like and bring it to me to eat so that I may give you my blessing before I die. Uh, the narrative goes on here is Isaac, now an old man, he's, he's about the age of 100. Interestingly, he's going to have 80 more years to live. Uh, he's already old, and you can tell that he's experienced the wear on his body. He's already blind. He's not able to see, uh, and he thinks he is nearing his death as 100 years old. Uh, by the way, just as a side note, I'm not sure exactly how old these twins are, but clearly Esau is older than 40. Uh, One commentator or one pastor actually suggested that the twins are about 77 years old at the time of this story. I'm not sure where he got those numbers, but no, these are not teenagers. These are grown men now with their elderly father playing games in the home. They're old men, older men at this time. But either way, Isaac now thinks his time uh, to die is nearing, so he calls his old son Esau to give the ceremony to pass on the blessing. So he calls Esau, and notice, this is going to be a major theme. What does Isaac want? He wants food. We saw that earlier. What's Isaac motivated by? He likes good food. Why does he love Esau more than Jacob? It's because Esau brought good food. And so Isaac says, listen, this is what we're going to do. You're going to go out. You're going to get the game that you're so good at getting. You're going to cook up that food, which I love, and you're going to bring it to me. And once I have a full tummy again of what I really love, then I'm going to give you a blessing from Almighty God. This blessing was an actual blessing of speaking on behalf of God, prophetically, uh, God's spiritual blessing. Now, now the question we need to ask at this point is, is Isaac scheming against God here? Is Isaac deceitfully plotting uh, against God's plan? I think the answer is absolutely. Now, on the one hand, we need to acknowledge the text does not reveal whether Isaac heard of God's speaking to Rebecca a couple chapters ago. But I would say it would be very doubtful that Rebecca would keep that prophecy to herself. I think it's very doubtful that Rebecca would not tell her son that God had chosen the younger to serve the older. Uh, even more than that, family blessing ceremonies were a group event. By the very fact that he's trying to hide this and do it without Rebecca and without Jacob, he is scheming purposely. He's trying to skirt this one under the rug. He is trying to do this quickly without getting caught. And again, Isaac is shown here not in a positive light. Note that repeated throughout, it is the motivation by food that he loves, the food that he has a love for Isaac for, or Esau for, is what is driving him. Again, this is a broken home. And we see Isaac here going against God's will, trying to give a spiritual blessing to an unspiritual son because he prefers him over the younger. He wants to secretly bless him. Now notice this is discovered in verse 5. We have Rebecca overhearing this plan. The imagery here, and this is intentional. The imagery here is of Rebecca sneaking around the home, or the tent rather, and, and overhearing this, uh, spying her own husband out so that she can find out what he's doing behind her back. Rebecca hears the plan of what her husband Isaac is going to do, and it is the opposite of what God revealed to her so long ago. And the point is simply this, and we're going to see this throughout the text. The point is emphatic, this is a broken home. The point of the text is to show here uh, the brokenness in this home and especially the brokenness of this marriage. You know, just think for a moment how this marriage began. This was a match literally made in heaven. Uh, We saw that when Rebecca was brought to Isaac, he welcomed her into his mother's tent. There's this beautiful marriage that formed, but the years have worn on, and notice where they're at now. This is a home where husband and wife are doing their own thing, scheming behind each other's back. There's no openness. There's no communication. In fact, what I learned this week, which is interesting, this text is pointing out that this home is broken because at no point is a family ever together. They're always separate, doing their own thing, scheming behind each other's back. This is a marriage that has grown to distrust. The brokenness and the choosing the favoritism has spilled over to now to where this marriage is fractured. This is a sad event in the home of one of God's people. Isaac should have consulted as the husband with his wife. Rebecca, rather than scheming to go behind her husband's back, should have gone to him and spoke to him and reminded him of what God said. 
No one in the text is doing what God has calling them to do. Never is the family together. They are all fractured. Uh, what is the point this morning? The point is that this is a believing home and it is a dysfunctional home. Each member of the family is acting on their own desires apart from what God has told them to do. And you know, that is what really stands out about this grieving story, isn't it? That there's no openness, that there's no transparency, there's no unity, there's no oneness between a husband and wife, but rather each doing their own thing. The family is separated. And by the way, just let's make some application at this point. Does this not highlight the importance of what God teaches in his word about proper marriage relationship? Does this not highlight the blessing that comes when a husband, a godly man, rules his home as a servant leader? When a husband leads his family in the forefront, leading his wife with the care and compassion of Christ for his church, Isaac's not doing that. And does this not also teach godly women submitting to their husband, bringing flourishing to the home? Rebecca's not doing that. You see, when God's people do not follow God's plan and God's will for the way marriage works, this is the byproduct. Brokenness and pain. We are, we are reminded again, God gives us teaching his word not to make us miserable, but to keep us from misery. When husbands are leading servant-like leadership, and when wives are submitting as they're called to, it flourishes and there's beauty in the home. When that doesn't take place, you get exactly what's taking place here. Husband and wife fractured, leading to a fracturing of the family. Misery and brokenness. Now, secondly, though, notice we need to note the deception of the blessing here, and we're going to need to summarize without rereading much of the passage, but notice in verses 6 through 10, Rebecca's decept, uh, deceptful, uh, deceitful plan. Uh, as soon as she heard this, rather than go to her husband, she immediately schemes up a plan. She calls her son, notice that, her son Jacob, to join her. And here's her plan. She sends Jacob out to get two goats. Quick, get some goats, get the best of them. I want you to bring them back, Jacob, because listen, I know exactly how your dad likes to have his food cooked. I've been with him a long time. I know exactly how he likes it. You bring those goats here, we'll slaughter them, we'll cook them up, and then you're gonna take this food and you're gonna pretend to be your brother and you will receive the plan. Uh, and notice as well, if you gaze at the text, notice the coldness of this. There's this urgency, quick, do this before he dies. Notice Rebecca. Uh, yeah, your, your dad's old. Quick, we need to do this before he dies. And notice that Jacob objects. Not because it's more morally sinful. Notice that Jacob objects because he looks nothing like his brother Esau. We've been reminded once again, and I mentioned this to my sons this morning when we read this passage, I really want to know what Esau looked like. Uh, I had some goats growing up, and I have no idea how goat hair could ever mimic how hairy Esau must have been. But this was a major concern because if it's that hairy, obviously, Jacob looked nothing like Esau. And that's his objection. Not that this is sinful, not that this is contrary to God's will, but rather, God may curse him. Notice that. Jacob says, listen, if I get caught doing this, Mom, this has got huge consequences. Rather than a blessing, I may receive God's curse. And this is where it gets even more shocking. Notice what Rebecca says. Let that curse be on me, my son. Notice that. That is blasphemous. Rebecca is so motivated. She doesn't stop and pause. She is so driven to get what she wants for the son that she loves. She is willing to say, listen, let God curse me if that's what it's going to take. Rebecca is driven so hard here to get what she wants. And so we know here that Jacob goes forward with this. Rebecca uh, gets some of Esau's clothes. We'll see in a moment that it's because it has his smell and she puts the hair of the goat on her son. And you notice, here's the point here. She knows she is sinning. By the way, to all of us, and especially to the young people present here, if you are doing something that you're afraid to get caught in, that is a clear sign that it is wrong. And Rebecca is doing something she's afraid to get caught in. Why? Because this is wrong. She is about to trick the husband whom she vowed to through such a deceitful plot as this. From beginning to end, this is offensive to God. And even more than that, notice this, her heart is not fully trusting God. If she would just step back for a moment and say, listen, God's got this. God's promised this. I'm going to rest in God. I'm going to do what God says. But again, she will not trust God. It's a weak faith. She's trusting her own plan. And notice the deception carries out with Jacob's lies. Again, in verse 17 through 27, you have the tension 
of this back and forth between a father and a son. As a father is doubtful, but the son blatantly lies. Notice the back and forth. First of all, Isaac hears Jacob come in, and he asks the question, how is it that you got this so quickly? That was quick. How did you get the game? How did you cook it up? Notice what Jacob says. Your God gave me the ability to do this. Yeah, God just blessed it. This went really well, Dad. God gave me what I needed. That's why it was so quick. Notice the second interplay. Isaac is doubtful. He hears the voice of Jacob, but he feels the body of Esau. He, he does, he's doubtful, so since he can't see, he's so blind, he must rely on his physical te- uh, touch, physical sense of touch, and so Jacob allows him, and he feels the goat here, and he's convinced that this must be Esau. And notice the last test. Notice that Isaac's not fully convinced yet. Throughout the text, he's blessing him, but notice the last test is the sense of smell. He brings, Isaac, or brings Jacob close, rather, not so much that he can kiss him, but that he can smell him. See, Isaac's not sure of what's going on. Isaac also is giving sign that he's doing something schemingly. He's trying to hurry up and get this done, and he's not so sure. And so he goes through each of the senses that he has left to try to figure out, is this really true? Is this really Esau? And throughout, notice that Jacob holds nothing back. He will boldface lie to his father to get what he wants. Again, consider what would happen if any of these people would have stopped and stepped back and said, listen, this is not pleasing to God. Let's do what God would have said. The story would have turned out completely different. I notice the deception works. Isaac is finally convinced. He fills his belly with the food that he loves. And notice the blessing, verse 28. It says, may God give you of heaven's dew and of earth's riches, richness, an abundance of grain and new wine. May nations serve you and peoples bow down to you. Be Lord over your sons and may the sons of your mother bow down to you. May those who curse you be cursed and those who bless you be blessed. Now if those sound familiar to you, it's because it should. That's the exact same blessing as what God gave to Abraham in chapter 12. Uh, Isaac here is speaking prophetically on behalf of God. He is pronouncing God's blessing on behalf of God, the blessing that carries over from Abraham to Isaac and now inadvertently is be given, uh, being given to Jacob. Uh, it is material gain, prospering life. We're going to see that when he meets with Laban. It is that the nations would bow down and that a nation would come from Jacob and that the Lord would protect him from all of his enemies. Isaac is literally placing this blessing on behalf of God on his son. And here's the point this morning. Jacob takes advantage of his father and lies in order to get what God has promised to give to Jacob already. Notice that. The whole point of the text is this was not necessary. Why? God would have saw it done. But rather what we see here is a text that scandalizes us with the cold-hearted lies of Jacob. This is immensely sinful. And it's meant to scandalize us with the spiritual blindness of Isaac. Uh, but we don't have time to go into it. There are numerous uh, ironies that you find in the text, and one of them is that Isaac is living by his senses, and it's meant to show us how spiritually blind he is in that. That's the point. Rather than looking to God and being spiritually uh, filled with sight, he's trusting himself. And the whole point of the text is he's blind. Without trusting in God and doing things God way, God's way, we become blinded and fall to our own error. And here's the point. Despite both of their sin, God's promises reach the promised son that he already foretold would reach it. That's the point. God's sovereign plan came to pass even through the sin of these two men. And then I notice finally, thirdly, the division of the blessing. We have in verses 30 to 33, uh, Esau's eventual return. Again, notice the wonder of this text It says, scarcely had Jacob got out, uh, his foot has barely got out of the tent, and around the corner comes his brother Esau, all happy with his food, ready to receive the blessing, and he scarcely had escaped, and here comes his son. Uh, The text is meant to give you the suspense of the feeling that you get when you know you're doing something wrong and are about to get caught. And notice what happens. He opens up the tent. He speaks out to his father, says, Father, get up. I'm ready for my blessing. Here is the food. Notice your text. Look at verse 33 with Isaac. It says that Isaac, what? Trembled violently and said, Who is it then? Who who was it then that hunted game and brought it to me? I ate it just before you came, 
and I blessed him. And notice this, and indeed he will be blessed. Isaac doesn't just tremble a little, he trembles violently. Why? He got caught. Isaac trembles because he knew he was going against God. He knew he was doing something he shouldn't have done, and God intervened. He violently trembles because he got caught. He's spiritually blind. He was doing it his way, and he blessed the wrong son. He was outwitted, and God's plan came to pass. And then notice the division with Esau's pleading. In verses 34 through 36, notice this grown man begin to cry violently and respond with deep anger. Uh, you read the text over and over, you are told that he cried out loudly and wailed over this. Why is he angry? He's angry because the blessing was taken from him. He's angry because he was deceived from what he, from what he thought he rightly deserved. And by the way, notice something. Technically, he should not be angry because he sold these rights earlier. When he sold the birthright, along with it would have been this blessing, and he knew that. He was trying to get what he had already sold. And you notice here, Esau begs for any blessing possibly left over. And notice this blessing now. It's really a counter-blessing, verse 39. His father Isaac answered him, Your dwelling will be away from earth's richness and away from the dew of heaven above. You will live by the sword and you will serve your brother. But when you grow restless, you will throw his yoke from off your neck. Why Why does Isaac give this blessing? It is really not a blessing, it's really a curse. Isaac gives this blessing because he's speaking on behalf of God. Esau, you rejected me. Now I'm going to reject you. This is a counter-blessing. Isaac, speaking on behalf of God, literally gives an anti-blessing. One, Esau, who rejected God, will be rejected from the blessings of God's creation. God says, listen, you will not come to, to me. You will not soften your heart to me. I will harden the earth. You will not reap bountifully. Second thing, you rejected me, and so now you will not live a life of peace, You will live a life life of violence. You will live by the sword, Esau. There will be no peace in your life. And the only hope he has is eventually he will cast off his brother's yoke, will come later with the nation following him, and he will distance himself from his brother. But you see, that also is a curse. Because to distance yourself from the promised line is to distance yourself from the covenant blessing. Here's the point this morning. Esau got what Esau deserved. Esau had no spiritual bone in his body. He had no spiritual tenderness in his heart. He did not love the God of his father, and therefore the God of his father cursed him. So in the end, God, speaking through his father, pronounces the division between Jacob and Esau. Esau will go forth and carry on with the line of the seed of the serpent. He has rejected God, and therefore God has rejected him, even as a covenant child. And now he will distance himself from here on out. Here's the point this morning. All of this was in God's sovereign plan. All of this was sinful. Every person is responsible for their sin, but God worked through the scene to make sure the blessing he sovereignly ordained reached the son that he had called. Now, what are some of the points of this? Why, does this, why is this in our text? And, and on the one hand, uh, there's two parts, I think, that, that are in here. One is to encourage us. Listen, if this is part of a believing home, what encouragement If these are people of God, if Isaac, Rebecca, and Jacob are those whom God can work through, God can work through people like you and me. This text is to encourage us to remind us that the church has always been messy. The church has always been filled with sin. And God is a faithful God. You know, if it were up to me, I would have said to Isaac, enough of this. I'll find someone else who will follow me. But that's not our God. Our God is faithful when we are faithless. He holds fast fast to his promises, and he will work even through a sinful, messy family like this. Believers this morning, that's the hope of the church. That's why we come here every Sunday morning. Not because we have our lives all together, but because we are redeemed people who still have work of redemption that God needs to do in our hearts and our life. So this is meant to be a word of encouragement. But I think as well, this text is meant to be a word of warning. It is a word of warning that if you think, and if I think, We can go against God's will and sin and we'll get away with it. God says you've got another guest coming. If you're practicing sin, God says from this text, if you're living in an area of your life contrary to my revealed will, if you think that you've got this hidden area in your life that I don't know about and you're not going to repent of it, be warned. The sins will find you out. There are consequences. We'll see in a moment uh, that will find you. The reason Isaac trembles is he was found out of going against God. Let me ask you, where are you today? Where are you this morning? Are you following after God? Are you repenting of your sin? Are you clinging to God by faith? Or are you like Esau, 
doing your own thing with no spiritual concern. Oh, be warned from this text. Be lovingly warned from this text. That to, to, to not cling to God is to be rejected by God. To not have a heart that clings to God by faith is to be for all eternity forsaken because of refusal to receive this God. We find here a warning, but we also find the joy of the gospel. So in conclusion, as we come to a close, two things. First of all, we need to understand the gospel. Where is the gospel in the text? And I, I think it's for, in the fact that it's by God's sovereign will. We see here that God's plan will always happen, like we read from Acts 2 just a few moments ago, that happened by God's sovereign plan. Christian, this morning, that's exactly what happened on the cross of Calvary 2,000 years ago. God sent the sinless Son. The Son hung upon the cross of Calvary. He did what the Father told Him to do. Christian, that gives us great joy this day because God has done what He promised to do in the Garden of Eden. Our sins have been laid upon the Son. We are forgiven. And this means that we are assured that nothing can remove us from the Father's hand. That's, you know, that's one of the blessings of Romans 8, isn't it? That since God is sovereign, nothing can separate us from the hand of God. Christian this morning, rest in that. If God is sovereign over even sinful men and women throughout human history, nothing can pluck you from your Father's hand. And I, secondly, and I want to end with this, it also teaches us, as I hinted a moment ago, the consequences of our sinful actions. Rebecca and Jacob, yes, they are believers. They do have faith. But the Bible here does say that because of what they do here, there were consequences. And I learned this this week. First of all, for Rebecca, her, dece her deception here means that she's actually going to lose Jacob. We're going to see that Lord willing next week. The son whom she loves will have to leave, and they will never see each other again. The son whom she loves and her heart is clinged to, she will never see again because of what she has done. And even more than that, and this is something I learned this week, this is the last we will really hear of Rebecca. The Bible will not tell us of her death. Interestingly, it will tell us of her nurse's death. Part of the implications of that is, God says there's consequences. Yes, you're a believer, but there's consequences. And so she is now going to disappear from the storyline of Scripture. And even more than that, we're going to see that Jacob as well will bear the consequences for his sin. Interestingly, and intentionally, ironically, he will be deceived. He'll be deceived by blindness by his uncle who will veil Leah from him so that he will be like his father, thinking he's going to receive the wife who was promised to him, but he'll be deceived. Uh, interestingly, another irony of Jacob's life is that his own sons will trick him with another slain goat when they take Joseph's coat of many colors and soak it with the blood of a goat to deceive their father. Here's the point this morning. These are believers, these are people redeemed by the blood of Christ who will come. But there are always consequences for our sin. Believer this morning, take that to heart. Perhaps you're here and you're engaging in something and you think God doesn't know. Or maybe you think you're doing something secretly and it will not harm anybody. Listen, the Bible here is to warn you and to me, do not play around with sin. We may be forgiven of sin, yes and amen, but there are consequences when we give ourselves over to them. But in the end, what a joy it is to know God is sovereign. Our Savior is good, and He delivers messy sinners like you and me. Amen. Let's pray. Our gracious God and our Father, we pray, O Lord, that You would send Your Spirit, that He would write the application that each of us need upon our hearts this morning. Father, we thank You for even sobering texts such as this that humble us. So, Father, we thank You for Your love for sinners. Bless us now that as we go from here, we rejoice in the gospel of Your Son. And we ask this in Christ's name alone. Amen.